first I want to thank the, the pastors of the church here for opening, this, opening the doors to all of us to come in and share our, our heart with Mormon people for, with you guys. This is awesome. And, and secondly, I want to thank all of you for coming. And, I, and on behalf of all the ministries that are here, I want to say you guys just bless our hearts because we love Mormon people. We want to minister to Mormon people and to see this many people that are interested in learning how to do that more effectively is just an awesome thing. So thank you all for coming. Um, my family and I, we moved to Utah about 18 years ago. And we moved to Utah primarily because we had been to a camp in Utah and one of the pastors had challenged us, on your way home, driving down Highway 89, see how many Christian churches you can find. <laughs> okay. I, I didn't know that was a loaded question. And we literally, we drove, what, 300 miles and didn't see one Christian church. Went through 24 small rural communities. No Christian churches. And that just, that broke our hearts, literally. We, we came to Utah about a year and a half later as a result of that and moved into Ephraim, Utah. Um, at that point in, in history, there was hardly any Christianity in the whole county. Um, we, the first year we were there, we, we met two older women that were uh, Christians, and that was all the Christians that were in our whole community. And so we uh, have been ministering there for the last 18 years. Um, our ministry right now is called Tri Grace Ministries. Tri has to do with the Trinity, and Grace has to do with the Gospel of Grace, which are the two main issues that we need to deal with with Mormon people. Uh, the, the Godhead, the, the, the Trinity, the, as, as we understand the Bible teaches it, and the gospel of grace. So they need to try grace. So we named our ministry that. <laughs> our ministry is primarily a seed planting ministry. You know the parable of the sower? Sower went out to sow and he just sown seeds everywhere. They're falling on the path, they're falling in the weeds, they're falling all over the place. And he's just sowing as many seeds as he can sow. And that's our ministry, is just sowing as many seeds as we can sow so that some of those seeds will fall on good soil and we will see fruit. And we have. We have seen fruit over the years, and it's been a, a great blessing. My wife said, you're not going to wear that T-shirt up there to talk, are you? And I said, it's an illustration. This is one of the seeds. You know, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship. You want to see the shirt, you can look at it later, but, but this is one of the seeds. And you try, to, you try to pass a tract to a Mormon, and most of them, 90, 99% of them, will go right in the trash because their church has told them that they are spiritual pornography. Okay, So do not open that stuff. Do not look at it. But they can't throw this away. All right, And they read it. I walk into Walmart, and I see people reading that thing. <laughs> looking at the back and reading the back and it's it's a message it's what we do um, another seed that we've spent a lot of time planting are the living hope videos and if you sat in on that last video wow powerful and we've sown literally tens of thousands of those videos all over Utah and they are seeds that we are seeing produce fruit so I, if you don't if you're not familiar with the living hope videos I would encourage you to go over and talk to the men at that table and to, to purchase some of those videos. If you can get a Mormon to watch those, they are the most powerful seeds you'll ever plant in their hearts. Um, any tidbit of truth that you can plant in their hearts um, is a seed that God will use. And I want you to know that, that you never will, I never have, Pastor Terry never has saved anybody. We aren't in the business of saving people. All we're in the business of doing is sowing seeds. And when those seeds fall, it's God that makes the seed germinate, and it's God that makes the seed sprout, and it's God that makes the seed grow. And if, they, if their eyes get opened up, it's God opening their eyes. And so that's our goal, is to plant as many seeds as, as we can. Um, early on in our ministry, we were told that the LDS people are unreachable. You can't reach them. They're too brainwashed. It's just too hard. You're never going to convince them. I've seen, I know missionaries that have been in Utah for years and years. They've never seen any fruit. So you're good luck is what they basically told us. And uh, I have a story to tell you to illustrate the fact that that's a big fat lie. 
It is. It's a big, fat lie. Uh, I was at the Manti pageant on the street talking to whoever wanted to talk to me, and an el elderly gentleman walked up to me and said, well, tell me who you are and tell me what you're doing here. So I just told him who I was. He said, well, I'm going to give you one minute. Tell me why you're here and what your message is. So I said, well, I'm here because I, I love Mormons. Uh, if I didn't love Mormons, I wouldn't waste my time to come out on the streets and talk to you guys. I love you guys. And I'm here to share the, the true gospel of the Bible with you. And he said, you know what? I can tell that you are very, very sincere. But you're wasting your time. And by God's providence, at that very moment, Mitz walked by. And I said, Mitz, come here. I said, Mitz, I want you to meet Joe. Joe, this is Mitz. Mitz left the Mormon church. Mitz, tell Joe why you left. And he's like, you left the church? <laughs> yeah, and so she starts telling him about how she had a, has a relationship with Jesus now. And while she's talking with him, I see, let me see, what's my list? I see Stacy, who's another former Mormon. She was here last night, in fact. And I said, Stacy, come here. As soon as Mitz got done talking to Joe, I said, Joe, don't, don't go. I want, to, I want you to meet Stacy. Stacy's a former Mormon. Stacy, tell, tell Joe why you left. So she starts telling Joe about how awesome it is to, to have, have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And while Stacy's talking, I look around, and there is Dee Dee. Dee Dee, quick, come here. And Dee Dee is Stacy's sister. So I introduce Joe to Dee Dee. And then I introduce Joe to Lana, Stacy and Dee Dee's mom. And then I introduce Joe to Chrissy. And then I introduce Joe to Janelle. And the very last one, he got done talking with Janelle, and uh, I saw Annette. Some of you probably know Annette. I'm just going to describe her for you. She is the white version of Aunt Jemima. <laughs> she loves everybody. And she will give you a big bear hug, and she will just pour the love of Jesus all over you. And, and that's Annette. And I said, Joe, I want you to meet Annette. And she gave him a bear hug, and he looked at me with eyes that big around. <laughs> And she just poured the love of Jesus all over him. And when she, when she got all done, I said, Joe, we're not wasting our time. Now, I want to ask you, how many of you are former LDS people, uh, converted to Christianity? <laughs> That's awesome. That is absolutely awesome. We are not wasting our time. This is, this is for sure. All right, what I want to do this morning is we're going to talk about Joseph Smith and we're going to introduce to you uh, the man that I think today they say nearly 14 million people are following, including the splinter groups that are polygamous groups. And 14 million people are following the prophet Joseph Smith Jr. Um, Jesus warned us that there would be false prophets. Uh, Matthew, 28, or Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20 says this, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good, fruit cannot bear good, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Therefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at Joseph Smith Jr. and see if he was a prophet of God or not. We're going to put his, the, the test that Jesus gave us on Joseph Smith to see if he was a prophet of God or not. We're going to test him by his fruits. And uh, to test Joseph Smith's character as a prophet of God, we're going to examine the historical facts surrounding his polygamy. And I want you to, I want you to know right up front, because I want to be completely fair about this, the issue is not so much his polygamy as it is his choice in women. All right, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain that to you in a minute. It's not so much the polygamy itself, it's his choice in women. And I say that because there are men in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that practice polygamy that God calls very godly, righteous men. So uh, it's not that I want to say I approve of polygamy. I don't believe it has any place in the church age. Jesus didn't allow for that. But what we're going to be talking about is Joseph's choice in women. Uh, first of all, some facts. And just, just to be fair about this, because I don't want people to get the wrong idea that we're somehow condemning Joseph for something that the people in the Bible did. Because what Joseph did was very different. All right? In the Old Testament, from the earliest chapters of Genesis through the kingdom period of Israel, polygamy was practiced. Um, in the Mosaic Law, the concept of polygamy is neither explicitly condoned nor condemned. 
All right, so it was practiced in the Old Testament. We acknowledge that. And, and uh, the idea of polygamy itself is part of the Old Testament scriptures. In the New Testament, however, it seems clear that Jesus and his apostles initiated safeguards to keep the practice of polygamy out of the Christian church. I don't believe, according to what Jesus taught, that it was ever God's intention. It was something that was man's invention, man's idea, and it never worked very well. And so Jesus, in the New Testament, through the apostles, uh, condemned polygamy, didn't allow it to enter into the church age. So I want to be really clear about that. Now let's look at uh, polygamy from an LDS perspective. And I want to show you just a little bit of some of the problem that the Mormon church has with this whole concept of polygamy. Because in the Book of Mormon, in 1830, Joseph Smith recorded the following. It says, the word of God burdens me because of your grosser crimes, for they seek to excuse themselves in committing whoredoms because of the things which were written concerning, concerning David and Solomon, his son. David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was an abominable, was, which was abominable before me, saith the Lord. So in, in the book of Jacob, in the book of Mormon, David and Solomon are used as the prime examples of how horrific and horrible polygamy was. All right, now, a few years later, in 1843, Joseph Smith supposedly received a revelation from God which contradicted the prohibitions of polygamy in the Book of Mormon. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 132 introduced a new and an everlasting covenant which commanded to make polygamy to be practiced in the church. Now, get this con now consider this uh, contradictory statement. David also received many wives and concubines and, and also Solomon, and in nothing did they sin, save in those things which they received not of me. David, David's wives and concubines were given unto him of me. I mean, this is as blatant a contradiction as it could possibly be between the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants. And then, again, in 1890, LDS prophet Wil Wilford Woodruff, say that three times fast, uh, supposedly received a new revelation from God which contradicts the commandments issued in DNC 130, 132. This new revelation is known to the LDS people, to Mormons, as the manifesto which banned polygamy from being practiced in the LDS church. So from 1890 to the present, anyone practicing polygamy has been excommunicated from the church, which would keep them from ever being, ever reaching the highest level of heaven for a Mormon. And so you can see how the Mormon church has flip-flop back and forth on this topic, depending on what the prophets decided was, was okay for the time. And uh, I'm glad that in the Bible we don't have that kind of flip-flop going on. Um, in Sacred Loneliness is the book we're going to be looking at, and this is a, a book that was written by an LDS historian named, named Todd Compton, and he has the highest credentials in the Mormon church. He is, he is a Mormon in good standing. Um, served a mission in Ireland, is a graduate of BYU University, was awarded a uh, best book award by a couple different organizations that, that examines the, the plural wives of Joseph Smith. He presently serves on the Board of Elders for the Journal of Mormon History. So he's a well-documented LDS historian, still in good standing with the Mormon Church. So the information we're going to share with you today is documented by Mormon history, by Mormon historians, it's a good source. And you can come check it out later if you have any questions about that. The facts surrounding Joseph Smith polygamy, and I'm just gonna give you an overview. I gave you a, a handout, an overview of Joseph Smith's plural wives, and, and this information is in this handout, okay? 11 of the marriages that Joseph Smith had, a third of the wives that he married, were uh, to, to, to teenage girls, uh, ages 14, through 19. So 11 of the marriages were to, to very young girls. 11 of the marriages were to women who had living husbands. He married married women, okay? Um, this is called polyandry, or poly, a, a polyandrous relationship. One woman married to two husbands. Um, Joseph also married two sets of young sisters. He married three sets of sisters, but one, two sets of young sisters and Joseph married two sets of mothers and daughters. And so these are the historical facts surrounding Joseph Smith. And so we wanna talk just briefly about why that's a problem. Okay, why is that a problem? Um, first of all, polygamy was illegal in every state that Joseph Smith pra practiced plural marriage. 
It was illegal back then, and the reason in 1890 that they banned polygamy was because it was illegal. So I'm wondering what the difference was. You know, why was it okay for Joseph Smith to break the law, but then the Mormon church decided they were not going to break the law, so they banned polygamy. So it's kind of a disconnect there. Joseph Smith also had an apparent taste for young flesh. Um, as he <coughs> excuse me, as he married 11 young women uh, in pioneer days, to be, to be fair, um, young women often did get married. But to marry 11 young women was unheard of. And today, in the LDS church, uh, or in, in America, um, it's not accepted. Uh, Warren Jeffs is in prison today for this very same sin, this very same the breaking of the law. Okay, some more problems. Um, the problem that deals with him marrying married women. I, I think that's probably one of the biggest problems in his choice of women. Um, the question arises, what exactly is adultery? You know, you're going to marry somebody else's wife, and then you're going to consummate your marriage with that wife? Uh, isn't that the exact definition of adultery? And so I, I think that's a problem. Todd Compton states this, in case anybody wonders whether or not the LDS historians think that Joseph Smith was actually consummating his marriages, um, Utah Mormons, including Smith's wives, affirmed repeatedly that he had physical sexual relations with them. Therefore, there is no good evidence that he did not have sexual relations with any wife, previously single or polyandrous. And so the fact that he was sleeping with all these women is pretty much an established fact, which is a problem. Number four, the law of God forbids marriage to a mother and a daughter. And he married two mothers and daughters, which is a complete breaking of the, the Old Testament law of God. Uh, one more significant problem is that a, a true prophet can't lie. It's, it's not part of, the, part of the puzzle for a true prophet to be able to lie. But Joseph Smith, one month prior to his death, he had 34 wives at that time, um, publicly proclaimed in a sermon that there were accusations being leveled at him in regard to his practice of, of pol uh, polygamy that were false. Um, he said this, What a thing it is for a man to be accused of committing adultery and having seven wives when I can only find one. So that's a bold-faced lie. He had 34 wives at that time. Um, at this time, I'm going to introduce to you a very good friend of mine and one who we have worked with on many occasions uh, going into polygamous communities, and her name is Doris Hansen. And so I'm going to let Doris come up and tell you a little bit about her story. Um, she actually was raised in a polygamous community, and her ministry is to polygamous women. So Doris, come on up. Tell them about your ministry. And I want you to notice as, we, as Doris comes up, we have the wives and, and husbands of their wives of Joseph Smith coming up. When we did this in Manti, we walked uh, probably about three or four blocks from where the women got dressed and, and they paraded down the streets of Manti and up the street and down towards where we were going to stand in, in front of the, uh, the uh, temple grounds and it was what? It was an amazing visual to, for the people to see all these many wives walking down the street and they all belonged to one man. These are the 34 wives of Joseph Smith and 11 husbands of the 11 married women that he married. Emma was the only legal wife that he had and uh, there are many, many um, people who think that he had more than 34 wives actually. Uh, these are documented for sure and so that's why we use the number 34. My name is Doris Hanson. I was born and raised in the Kingston Polygamy Group. Um, I was uh, threatened all my life that if I didn't live polygamy and accept it when I grew up, I was going to be doomed to hell and damnation for eternity. And I hated it, and I got away. I hated God for 
uh, many, many years after I got away, but God let me run away from him long enough so I could run right into him. And I did, and I got saved. And at that time, um, uh, I, I just had such a heart for the polygamous people. And I just, God just kind of laid it on my heart to know that at some point in the future I was going to have a ministry to polygamous. And so I started doing things behind the scene and, you know, and then mailings and different things that uh, nobody knew anything about but me. And it took 20 years, but God f opened up an opportunity in 2007 when Lifting the Veil of Polygamy was released. And we opened up a ministry called a Shield and Refuge Ministry. The Shield and Refuge is uh, that the, the polygamous people, I'm a missionary to the polygamous now, and the polygamous people who want to get out uh, will, can know that God will be their shield and their refuge to them uh, when they leave. And we'll give them a safe place to go and uh, help them get aligned back into real society. Tonight, um, we're going, first of all, I want to say something that happened last night. Chip had mentioned some uh, skeptics on a, from a Mormon um, guy that wondered if anybody got out of Mormonism and were happy. Last night out in the foyer, uh, someone came up to me and he said, does anyone ever get out of Mormonism and find happiness and find joy? And I said, uh, good heavens, yes, my goodness, you know, if you find Jesus, you do. If you don't find Jesus, you may not. And he, he, we talked for a minute, and then he walked off, and immediately a girl came up to me and shook my hand and said, hi, how are you? She says, you know what? I was a Mormon. I got saved six or eight months ago, and I'm so happy. <laughs> so yes, you get joy, joy abundantly. Tonight I want to talk about three of Joseph Smith's wives, and I'm going to talk first of all about Helen Mar Kimball. Helen Mar Kimball. 14-year-old Helen Mar Kimball. She was the daughter of Heber C. Kimball and was approached by 37-year-old Joseph Smith who taught her the mysteries of celestial marriage, which is known as polygamy. Now, Joseph Smith, of course, was the founder and the leader of the Mormon church. He was highly revered. He was respected among all the church members. He held a strong position of trust, and they believed that everything he said was from the very mouth of God. Now, the night before Joseph Smith's uh, proposal to 14-year-old Helen Mar Kimball, her father, Heber C. Kimball, had a conversation with his daughter and asked her if she would believe him if he told her it was right for a married man to take other wives. Well, according to Helen's personal writings, she said she felt like a small earthquake had shaken her emotions. She loved her father, and she really didn't think that he would lead her wrong, but uh, her sensibilities just kind of made it difficult for her to understand this, and it, she felt it very hard to believe it. Uh, she didn't know quite what to think. Well, the next morning after that, Joseph Smith arrived at the home, and he proposed to Helen Mar Kimball that, that day an illegal polygamous relationship asking her to be one of his plural wives. He persuaded her to enter into um, a, a spiritual marriage, not a temporal one. Now, Helen couldn't have known at that time that her father, Heber C. Kimball, and Joseph Smith had gotten together in advance and had planned uh, this transaction for a 14-year-old Helen to become one of Joseph Smith's plural wives. She said that Joseph Smith had told her that if she would agree to this marriage, it would ensure her eternal salvation and exaltation and that of her father's household and all of her kindred. And Helen said, quote, this promise was so great that I willingly gave myself to purchase so glorious a reward. She actually thought that her marriage to Joseph Smith was only for eternity and that her time in this life would be her own and that she wouldn't belong to him here. She seemed to relish the supposed independence that taking this step, this step apparently uh, was promised to her. And as it turned out, she discovered that she either misinterpreted Joseph Smith's intent or he may have purposely misled her about his intentions. She later said to a close friend, quote, I would never have been sealed to Joseph had I known it was anything more than ceremony. I was young, and they deceived me by saying salvation of our whole family depended on it. 
Now she said they deceived her. Well, her mother didn't deceive her. Her mother didn't have anything to do with it. But she's referring to Heber C. Kimball and Joseph Smith. They, she knows, they deceived her. Helen must have been very surprised to discover that this marriage included time as well as eternity, a physical union between this 14-year-old girl and the 37-year-old man. She hadn't even wanted to marry Joseph Smith, but she considered that it was a very small price to pay for the guarantee of her eternal life and the eternal life of the ones that she loved the most. Now, as church president, Joseph Smith was in a position of special trust, yet he practiced his deviant tendency to pedophilia, as is proven by his polygamous union, not just to one 14-year-old girl, as Chip said, but to seven girls, 17 years old and younger, and a total of 11 girls, 20 years old and younger. Now, let's put this in a contemporary perspective. There was an article in the Deseret News last month that tells of the case of a man in American Fork accused of having a sexual relationship with a 16-year-old student. This man is a former seminary prophet. He's 37 years old. He faces 14 first-degree felony charges and one second-degree felony charge of several different kinds of rape and forc forcible sexual abuse. Prosecutors agree that the charges against him are enhanced because he held a position of trust over this young girl. He had seduced and sexually molested her under the banner of being a special and trusted spiritual leader. Now, let's compare this 37-year-old American Fork principal with 37-year-old Joseph Smith. The American Fork principal seduces a 16-year-old seminary student Joseph Smith seduces a 14-year-old girl with an illegal polygamous union. <clears throat> the American Fork Principal is charged with 14 first-degree felonies. Joseph Smith is considered a holy prophet of God, and no one requires any accountability from him from his actions either then or now. In today's courts, with the evidence that's available, Joseph Smith would have been convicted of child molestation and placed in a cell next to Warren Jeffs. <clears throat> on, the, on the same page here, we also don't want to leave out Heber C. Kimball, 51-year-old Warren Jeffs, was tried and found guilty of doing what Heber C. Kimball did. Warren Jeffs was charged with being an accomplice to rape when he arranged the marriage of a 14-year-old girl to her cousin in the FLDS polygamy group, and this culture applauded his conviction. Yet Heber C. Kimball arranged the marriage of his 14-year-old daughter to a polygamist, and he's not held accountable either. In fact, he's called a holy apostle of God. In these two events, why wouldn't Joseph Smith be as guilty of child rape as a seminary principal? And why wouldn't Heber C. Kimball be as guilty as Warren Jeffs for arranging the marriage of his 14-year-old daughter? Helen Mark Kimball became a widow just one year later when Joseph Smith was murdered in 1844. She was then free to be romanced by and to be married by her longtime heartthrob, Horace Whitney. Sadly, however, after they moved to Utah, her husband, Horace Whitney, took two polygamous wives. And by that time, Helen was firmly accepting of and a hearty advocate of plural marriage. What I find heart-wrenching in these accounts of Joseph Smith's method of gathering to himself these plural wives is that he consistently brought God into the proposition. Having been born and raised in a polygamist home myself, I'm painfully aware of the use that they have when they use God in the teachings and threatenings of living polygamy. We were constantly threatened that we comply or be damned, accept polygamy or be destroyed, which is what Joseph Smith said in section 132. We were conditioned from the cradle when we grew up believing that it was God's requirement to become a plural wife. We were brainwashed, we were frightened into accepting it. So I can understand being born and raised with a polygamous mindset when that's all you've known since birth. It's natural to believe it. But none of the plural wives of Joseph Smith and these early Mormons were born and raised in a polygamy culture. They had not been brainwashed from birth like we were. Polygamy was not 
uh, something they were familiar with. It had nothing to do with salvation as far as they knew up until that point. Yet they believed what Joseph Smith claimed, that it was a holy principle and required by God. Sadly, they didn't study their Bible about it either, and even if they had, would they have been able to discern the truth that God really never required polygamy? And most alarming to me is that many of these women hesitated at first, like Helen Mar Kimball did, but later agreed to become a plural wife simply because she trusted the spiritual leadership of the Mormon Church. Several of these ladies asked God to, uh, for confirmation. And, and they received some alarmingly profound spiritual experiences confirming to them that they were to embrace plural marriage, and so they did with all their heart and soul. Of course, we know that feelings are not a barometer for truth, and spiritual experiences are not always from God. Some of these who did receive the spiritual manifestations were among those who became polygamy's most powerful advocates. Helen Mar Kimball had said that polygamy was a small price to pay for the salvation of her loved ones. I wonder if she ever found out in later years that Jesus paid the price for salvation and no one else can. Well, as you can imagine, um, there's 34 women up here, but there's also 11 men. And uh, for these men, polygamy was a great pain for them as well. Uh, created all kinds of turmoil inside of them and problems for them. I want to introduce to you Marinda Johnson. Marinda, you step forward. And uh, Marinda and her family in 1833 moved to Kirtland, Ohio, where she met a dynamic young Mormon convert named Orson Hyde. Dynamic young Orson Hyde, step forward there. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the next year, Marinda and Orson were married, and in 1835, just a short time after their marriage, Orson was ordained an apostle of the LDS Church. And uh, just so for your information, in the early in the early Mormon Church, the twelve apostles were traveling missionaries, which meant that Marinda spent a great time alone uh, in her first years of marriage. So she wasn't with Orson a lot because he was on his mission for the church. Um, evidently, Orson struggled with this situation as well. And, and in 1838, he disaffected from the LDS Church, and he wrote the, the infamous accusation that if Joseph Smith was not stopped, he would, quote unquote, be a second Muhammad to this generation. In 1839, however, he moved back to far west Missouri, a repentant, humbled man, and wanted to return to the church. A year later, Orson and Elder John E. Page were sent on a mission to Jerusalem. Can you imagine that? Back in the early 1800s, going on a mission to Jerusalem. Um, in, Octo in October of 1841, Orson Hyde stood on the Mount of Olives and consecrated Palestine for the gathering of Judah in the last days. And I actually visited his park that's set up there, the Hyde Park that's set up in honor of, of Orson Hyde traveling all the way to Jerusalem in the early 1800s. While Orson was on his mission, however, as he was returning from Jerusalem, Joseph Smith took Marinda as one of his polygamous wives. So while he was gone, without his knowledge, Joseph convinced Marinda, who was a hot, young, <laughs> pioneer woman, to be one of his wives. Okay? Now, we know she was hot because you're going to find out later that other men were after her, okay? So um, while, <laughs> while Orson was on his mission, Joseph Smith married her. Um, she was 26 at the time, and Joseph was 36. And we can only guess at the shock of this, uh, that this exposure to polygamy was for her, not to mention the fact that she was also entering into a polyandrous state where she already had a husband. It must have given uh, Marinda great turmoil in her own soul. Um, Todd Compton says that nearly everyone who has commented on their first introduction to polygamy wrote that they at first looked at it with revulsion and shock and fought the idea for a time. As Marinda was apparently um, in love with Orson Hyde, polyandry must have been enormously difficult for her. 
um, she and Orson had a good relationship when they were together, and so there was no reason to think that she was dissatisfied with her relationship with Orson. Although there were uh, conflicting reports as to exactly what happens, it seems most likely that Orson did not know of the marriage, and it was reported that he was extremely upset upon coming home from his mission to learn that Miranda had married Smith in his absence. So uh, men, can you imagine you know, going on a mission a significant mission for your church and coming home and finding out that your young bride is now the wife of the prophet of your church. Just shocking. It would be a shocking thing. Orson, however, did not stop living with Miranda at this time. Um, he accepted because he accepted the prophet Joseph Smith as a, a religious leader, accepted the, the, the relationship and the situation, and he continued to live with her. Um, Miranda continued to have children with Orson until 1858, so they lived together for a long time. Before his death, in 1878, Orson also married eight additional wives and fathered 32 children. So um, Orson bought into the polygamy idea and uh, became a part of that as well. Next, I want to talk, talk about Joseph Smith's wives number 20 and 21, the Partridge sisters. It's probably impossible to find a polygamy group anywhere that would prohibit a man from marrying sisters as plural wives. And it isn't unusual for uh, a man uh, to marry both a mother and a daughter. I'd like to read from a Leviticus 18, just a couple of verses. It says, do not have sexual relations with both a woman and her daughter. It is wickedness. Verse 18, do not take your wife's sister as a rival wife and have sexual relations with her while your wife is living. Joseph Smith set the precedence in Mormon polygamy for violating these particular commands in Leviticus 18. He did, he did marry mother and daughter, and he was guilty of marrying four sets of sisters as plural wives. The Lawrence sisters, the Huntington sisters, um, the Johnson sisters, and the Partridge sisters, and they're the ones I'm going to focus on now. There's 22-year-old Eliza Partridge and 19-year-old Emily. He married the younger one, Emily, first on March 4th of 1843, which was the same day that he married teenage girl, 19-year-old Flora Woodworth. Same day, two girls the same day, 19 years old. And four days later, he married Emily, um, Emily's older sister, Eliza, who was 22 years old. So in four days, Joseph Smith took three young brides, two of them 19 and one of them uh, 22, and he was 37 years old at the time. The sisters had known Joseph Smith uh, since 1831. He had baptized their father into the Mormon church, Edward. In fact, Edward became the very first Mormon bishop. Uh, in 1840, their father died. Her mother, their mother remarried uh, a widower, and that widower just happened to be the father of the Huntington sisters, whom Joseph Smith also took as spiritual wives. At the time of their father's death, uh, Emily and Eliza went to live in the Smith home. The sisters helped Emma out. She, they were babysitters. They helped her out with the housework. And they also came increasingly to the attention of the roving eye of their benefactor, Joseph Smith. Emma was very kind to the sisters, and no doubt she was very grateful for their help. Emily said that Emma was a very kind, good, and noble woman until polygamy came in the picture. There must have been a severe change in Emily, and I can understand that, as she found her husband increasingly dabbling in polygamy, uh, which would be, hard, it'd be it's, I know it's hard to take, I've seen it. The sisters were comfortable. They were content living at the Smith home. At least in the beginning, they would go horseback riding and have parties with, with uh, people their own age. But in the spring of 1842, the warmth of their living arrangement diminished when Joseph Smith set his sights on these two girls as potential celestial mates. Joseph approached Emily first. 
She was alone in the room and he told her that if she could keep a secret, he would tell her something for her benefit. She assured him that she could keep a secret, but there was no opportunity for him to talk to her at that point. So he said, if I wrote you a letter, will you promise to burn the letter after you read it? Well, there's a red flag. But she said, she said she would, but then she later regretted it, being sure that this wasn't proper. So she told him that she could not take the personal letter from him and to let the matter drop. So Joseph Smith didn't approach her again till her 19th birthday. But by that time, rumors had been flying around Nauvoo about the very subject that Joseph Smith wanted to talk to her about, and that was polygamy. One of Joseph Smith's plural wives was a Mrs. Elizabeth Durfee. Is she here? Mrs. Durfee. Well, she was, uh, she married Joseph Smith as a polygamous wife. She was 50 years old when she married Joseph Smith, and he was only 36. But Joseph Smith frequently would call on the older women like that to come and prepare some of the young girls for plural marriage to him. And she, Mrs. Durfee, was already married and living with another husband when Smith married her. Well, one day, Mrs. Durfee came and visited Emily and explained that Smith wanted to talk to her. Mrs. Durfee said she thought he wanted her to become his wife. And by now, Emily had been mentally prepared for such a request. Well, along with Mrs. Durfee, uh, Joseph Smith had also used Heber C. Kimball in his schemes to acquire wives. And so one day, Mrs. Durfee invited Emily to go to Heber C. Kimball's home. Emily had been helping Emma out with the, with the laundry all day long, but she went ahead and went to visit the Kimball home anyway, still wearing her work clothes that she'd been doing laundry in all day. Joseph Smith was there, and he told her what he had wanted to say earlier, and that was he taught her the principle of plural marriage. He said this principle had been revealed to him, and he asked her if she would marry him, and she consented on the spot, and they were married then and there. Her old, dirty work clothes was her wedding gown, and Heber C. Kimball performed the marriage. Joseph then went home his way, and Emily went home her way, and they both went home to the same residence. She later remarked, this was a strange way to get married. Now, Eliza didn't know Emily had married J Joseph Smith, but Emily knew Eliza could keep a secret, and so she told her about it afterwards. And then Joseph approached Eliza, and taught her the plan of celestial marriage and asked her to marry him, and she agreed. But she said later, quote, it was a hard trial for me, but I had the most implicit confidence in him. Four days later, she became his bride. As you can imagine, Emma Smith, um, his only, one and only legal wife, was also aware of the rumors that were going around. Smith was trying to talk Emma into going into plural marriage, and she didn't want to do it. And finally, after a couple of months, she told Joseph Smith that she indeed would allow him to take a plural, plural wives if she could pick his wives, two of his wives, for him. And lo and behold, she picked Eliza and Emily for Joseph Smith to marry, not even knowing that he had married them two months ago. So a second plural marriage ceremony took place, and Emma never knew about the first one. She had no way of knowing, and Emily said from that hour, Emma was our bitter en enemy. We remained in their house for several months, but things went from bad to worse. And after some troubling times, Emily finally brought it to an end. One day she sent for the sisters, and as they came into the room, she, they could tell that something was wrong, and Emma clearly was in command, and Joseph was mo looking much like a martyr. Emma was upset, and she said some very harsh words. She demanded that the plural marriages end, they be terminated, they find other husbands, and she said that Joseph must give up the girls or blood would flow. But she didn't say whose blood. <laughs> Well, the girls were indignant that Joseph Smith didn't stick up for them, but later on they understood uh, why he couldn't have done that. And um, after Joseph Smith was martyred, Eliza and her sister Carolyn married an Apo uh, a mass Lyman. Emily married Brigham Young, and they all migrated west. Emily died at age 75, Eliza died at 65, and she remained a defender of polygamy all her life. All right. I, I mean, isn't this, I mean, I've heard this a lot. and It's just almost too bizarre to believe, isn't it? I want to introduce to you uh, Henry Jacobs. 
and uh, his wife that he married, Zena Huntington, they married in 1841, and she lived with him until 1846. She bore him two children. Shortly after their marriage, however, Joseph Smith approached the newlywed couple. He knew, knew Zena as a, a young girl and maybe had introduced the idea of plural marriage to her at that time. But he uh, approached her and uh, asked if they would consider this celestial marriage contract he said that the Lord had made it known to him that he, uh, uh, that she, Zena, was to be his celestial wife. Joseph, however, told them that they could continue to live together as husband and wife. So he talked the couple into doing this. Surprisingly, Henry accepted this, but Zena struggled with the news. Zena remained conflicted until October when Joseph sent a message to her stating that he would lose his position as prophet and his life if she did not become one of his plural wives. So what kind of pressure is that to put on a young girl? Zena finally acquiesced. She was married to the prophet in October of 1841. Um, Henry knew of the marriage and accepted it. He believed that whatever the prophet did was right. So Henry accepted this relationship, a polyandrous relationship with Zena, until uh, the death of the prophet in 1844. So she was wife to both husbands until 1844. Following the prophet's death, one would think that Henry and Zena's marital situation should have simplified a bit because Joseph Smith is now out of the picture. Um, she and Henry, who had never stopped living together as husband and wife, probably expected to continue doing so now without a third member of the marriage triangle. However, it was shortly after Joseph's death that Brigham Young approached Zena. And she married him uh, for time in September of 1844. It was a very bizarre ceremony. Uh, it would be too long to read uh, to you this morning. Not, nonetheless, she remained married and cohabiting with Henry. It was not until 1846 that Zena and Henry's relationship officially ended. While Henry was on a mission for the church in England, Zena wrote him a letter telling him that she was now living with Brigham Young and no longer considered Henry to be her husband. Henry returned from his mission and settled in California. It's kind of interesting on their trip out west, he tagged along kind of behind the wagon train and just you could, the, the stories of that are really heart wrenching. He was just was heartbroken that his wife had rejected him from being his, her husband and uh, couldn't understand, understand it. He then later moved to California, but he was still in love with Zena. Uh, now the, one of the plural wives of Joseph Smith, uh, uh, Brigham Young. Um, Henry's letters to his wife, Zena, were heartrending. On September 2nd, 1852, he wrote, oh, happy, oh, how, oh, how happy I should be if I only could see you and the little children, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. I am unhappy. Henry lamented, there is no peace for, for poor me. My pleasure is you. My comfort has van vanished. O oh, Zena, can I ever, will I ever get you again? Answer the question, please. And the answer was no. He never uh, was able to see his wife again. And the final story tonight, I want to talk about Lucy Walker, Joseph Smith's 23rd wife, his 22nd plural wife. Lucy Walker, 17 years old. Lucy was sealed to Joseph Smith one day after her 17th birthday, and he was 37 years old, more than twice her age. So again, we see that Joseph Smith is attracted to and taking young teenage girls as plural wives. Lucy's father was converted to Mormonism when she was just six years old, and her mother was converted six year, or three years later. Eventually, the Walkers moved to Illinois. Lucy, uh, Lucy's mother died died in January of 1842, and then not long after her mother died, Joseph Smith moves, moves in for the manipulation here and sends Lucy's father away on a mission, denying both the father and the children proper grieving time. Three months later, when Lucy's 15 years old, she and her brother are invited to move into the Smith's home. 
Lucy was once asked how many uh, people lived in the Smith home, and she said the Lawrence sisters were living there, the Partridge sisters were living there, plus herself, and there was some domestic help. This was very convenient for Smith <laughs> to invite these young marriageable girls to move in and live with him under the guise of benevolence, and it's very odd how so many of them became his plural wives. Joseph Smith promo proposed to Lucy while she was staying at the Smith home, and she said that he asked to talk with her and told her, I have a message for you. I have been commanded by God to take another wife, and you are the woman. Lucy said this announcement struck her like a thunderbolt. He proceeded to ask her if she believed if he was a prophet of God. She answered, well, yes, most assuredly she believed he was. So he moved forward at that point to teach her the principle of plural marriage. He promised that it would form a chain that would never be broken worlds without ends. Uh, he asked what she thought about the idea, and she hesitated. How could she speak? She didn't have a mother to turn to. She didn't have a father to, for counsel or advice. She had no one to ask. So Joseph Smith offered some gentle persuasion. He promised Lucy, although I cannot under existing circumstances acknowledge you as my wife, the time is near when we will go beyond the Rocky Mountains and then you will be acknowledged and honored as my wife. He played upon her sorrow and her sense of aloneness, but then moved in for the, device, the, the decisive blow. He warned her there was a time limit in which she had to respond. This was a command from God. He would give her until tomorrow to decide, and if she rejected this message, the gate would be closed against her forever. Well, Lucy had some spunk, and she fumed <laughs> at this high-handed and threatening treatment, and she said this aroused the very scotch in her brains, or in her veins, and she, she stood toe-to-toe -to, -toe to Smith, looked him right straight in the face, and she said she required a revelation before she would submit to this proposition. <laughs> well, he promised her that if she would pray, she would receive her own personal manifestation from God, and so she did, and she did. She said she spent a, a restless, sleepless night until early morning dawn drew near, and she got her answer. She said a heavenly influence and feeling of supreme happiness took possession of her. She gave no other details about her spiritual experience, but this was evidently enough for her, and she told Joseph Smith, yes, she would marry him. And on May 1st of 1843, while Emma was away shopping in St. Louis, they got married. The only witness was Eliza Partridge and William Clayton officiated. Lucy continued to live in the Smith home without e Emma even ever knowing about the connection of, with polygamy in, with them. In fact, one day in a very pitiful statement was made to Lucy by Emma. Emma said she hoped that Lucy would never make a married woman unhappy by marrying her husband. There's volumes in that. Lucy Walker considered it was her duty to give herself up as a sacrifice to polygamy to help establish celestial marriage on the earth. The sacrificial duty was part of the brainwashing technique. I'm here to tell you, I've seen it a lot. Lucy had been sworn to secrecy about her marriage to Smith, and she'd never witnessed a secret plural marriage herself of, of others, or, or uh, and Emma knew nothing about the marriage either. So she certainly didn't give her consent like Section 132 said it was supposed to. So these deceits and secrecies are inherent in the practice of polygamy groups. At one time, Joseph Smith introduced Lucy to um, Heber C. Kimball and Brigham Young as his wife, but very few people really knew about it, and she went by the name of Lucy Walker. Someone once asked her if she knew of any children fathered by Joseph Smith, and she declined to answer the question. After Joseph Smith's death, as happened to many of the widows, Lucy Walker was married to Heber C. Kimball, and Brigham Young performed the ceremony. Lucy traveled west with Heber C. Kimball and with several of Smith's wives. She had nine children with Heber C. Kimball, but only five survived. She died in Salt Lake City in 1910 at the age of 84. Although many of Joseph Smith's wives seem to be kind and thoughtful and caring women, I can't help but reflect at the frustrations and the loneliness they suffered all the days of their lives as mere plural wives. You see, my father was a polygamist. He only had two wives, 
My mother was his second wife. Yet I vividly remember her tears, sometimes emotional outbursts, which at the time I didn't understand. I remember one day as a child, I snuck into her private diary. There were no private information there. She was just writing down her feelings her tireless efforts of trying to make God pleased with her and her sacrificial attitude towards life, which the life of polygamy demands. Yet she deemed it worth it. And I don't wonder that many of these polygamist women of early Mormonism would have had the same sacrificial martyr complex that my own mother had. In their minds, they were building treasure for heaven the painful sacrificial life of polygamy here was building that for them. They lived hard for their beliefs and it was a very hard life. I remember how difficult it was as a child growing up in a poverty stricken polygamous home, but that was nothing compared to the rough pioneer life of early Mormon polygamous women. How sad to realize that when they did die, they didn't wake up in heavenly glory to be reunited with their polygamist husband who had been crowned as a God in glory. But instead, each one of them had to face holy and almighty God with the question, what did you do with Jesus? What a tragedy that they all lived and died believing that their human husband was their savior. And that's the story of Lucy Walker Thank you so much for inviting us here tonight, or today, and we do hope that we helped you understand Mormon polygamy. I want to ask you guys to be praying for us. Uh, next week, we will be going to two polygamous compounds with a, a mission team from Laterno University. Doris will be joining us for those trips. And just keep us in your prayers. Um, there's a lot of unknowns when you go into those compounds. We've never had a problem. Doesn't mean there never could be a problem. So just keep us in your prayers. Uh, pray mostly that the Lord will open our, the hearts and the eyes of some of these women to contact Doris and to be rescued out of these situations. So thank you again. Thank you women thank and men you. For, your, for joining us. We appreciate it. <laughs>